It grew dark before she finally found her way back to her hotel. Hiroshi left a message on her hotel room's phone. I'm staying with my brother tonight, he said. Things are very bad. Call me. She scrambled to write the number down. When she returned the call, the phone rang three times. Help, a voice said. Then the line disconnected. Alondra stared at the receiver. She wasn't sure if she'd heard Hiroshi's voice or the voice of the doll. Whether a plea or a demand, the word had been in English. She took a moment to brush her long red hair, rebraid it, to splash cold water on her face. She stocked her messenger bag with her incenses and candles, matches, and took the hotel pads of hotel's pad of paper and pen from the nightstand. The night had grown cold while she'd been in her room. She made her way back to the local subway station with confidence, located the right platform, and awaited the train. Getting off at the other end would be problematic, though. She remembered the station. She thought she remembered the correct exit. Once she got into the maze of Tokyo streets, though, she'd have to trust her memory for landmarks. She had no idea of the name or number of Koichi Hiroshige's apartment building. She tried not to think ahead, dreading what she might find. Hiroshi Hiroshige sat in the hallway, his eyes red from crying, his back against the wall opposite his brother's apartment. He stood to open the door for her, a bottle of sake clenched in his free hand. In the bedroom, he said. Alondra stepped out of her shoes in the entry and fumbled her way to where she remembered the light switch to be. It didn't work. She took a white candle from her bag and lit it. In the bedroom, Koichi's body hung from the closet rug. His feet dragged on the floor. Alondra stared at the noose around his neck. It appeared to be a hank of long black hair. Across the futon's dirty sheets lay shards of, an, of the anatomical doll she'd seen earlier. Black hair splayed across the buckwheat pillow with rip in its cover. A small pile of grain spilled out across the futon. The doll's undamaged limb, limbs sprawled, unstrung from its shattered torso. One leg turned backward, toe inward, an arm was missing. Alondra shuddered with a deep childhood horror of the violence done to the child-sized doll. She turned away to see Hiroshi lurking in the doorway, out of sight of the corpse. Have you called the police? She asked. My phone stopped working after I called you. So it hadn't been his voice when she'd called. Alondra pulled things from her bag, sea salt, cedarwood chips, matches. She handed the pad of paper to Hiroshi and said, write your brother's name and his wife's maiden name for me. Kanji is fine. While he did so, she set up the incense burner and got the charcoal smoldering, then poured a ring of salt to run Koichi's feet. One of his toes poked through a sagging black sock. You should go for the police, Alondra said. I'll be okay here. Hiroshi hit the sake bottle hard, set it carefully on the dresser, and ran his fingers through his black hair to slick it back on his way to put on his boots. Alondra added cedar wood to the incense burner and tipped her face forward over the smoke. Then she encircled the futon with salt, careful that the ring remained unbroken. The room filled with whispers, a roaring wave like the sorceress of the sea. Alondra ignored it, lighting a few more candles, which she placed with the help of the compass. The shadows grew in the corner of the room, blacker than the Tokyo night. But the cedar burned with a clean scent that cleared the space inside her circle. She rubbed her clammy hands against her jeans and knelt on the futon to pick up a fragment of the doll's porcelain face. The doll's eye, brown and alert, rolled toward her. Can you speak, Alondra asked. Can you speak to me in English? From behind her back and over her head, the, voice stopped that. the doll's voice demanded, how can you help us? Her voice braided together several voices, speaking in unison. The death of our flesh did not free us. The destruction of this doll did not free us. Our tormentors are dead, and we are trapped. The shadows outside the circle dove at Alondra. Sheep lightning flared as they smashed into the boundary of her circle of salt. The electricity resolved itself into a single kanji, but Alondra could not read it. <coughs> it burned out before she could copy it for Hiroshi. Do you have a name? He called it Sakura. The, the words stumbled over their own echoes. Alondra wasn't sure if he was the doll maker for Koichi Hiroshige. She collected up shards of the porcelain, puzzling the pieces of the face into a shattered mask. Sakura-chan, Alondra asked gently, who are you here to punish? 
The voices moaned, unable to find a target for their hatred. Your owner is dead. Alondra smoothed the lock of black hair back from the fragment of forehead. Do you carry a reflection of your soul? Yes, the woman said clearly. Alondra copied Michelle Hiroshige's name on a scrap of paper, touched it to the candle flame, and held it until the fire menaced her fingertips. Then she tossed the ember into the air and said, You are released. Shadows raced around the room, knocking Hiroshi's bottle of sake from the dresser. Hiroshi Koichi is dead, Alondra said as she fit half of the rose petal lips into place. Do you carry a reflection of his soul? Can't you see what he's done to us? Yes, Alondra hissed, cutting them off. I see that he's paid for it. In the closet, the corpse's eyes opened, fixing her with a fish-eyed stare. Its tongue thrust out lasciviously. Its feet struggled to find purchase, but couldn't pull itself free from the noose around its neck. Despite the hammering of her heart, Alondra copied the kanji for her Koichi Hiroshige's name, then set the second scrap of paper afire. The corpse grabbed for her silently, its toes scrabbling on the closet floor. Watching to make sure it came no closer, Alondra blew on the note to make it burn a little faster. The heat kissed her fingers before she tossed the ember upward. You are released. The corpse slumped abruptly. The closing clothing rod protested its weight. The remaining shadow snarled and snapped, unable to get Alondra inside the circle. She crawled over the futon, collecting the last few shards of the doll's head. She turned each one over, tilted it toward the candle flame, searching for the doll maker's signature. Finally, she found a piece of scalp, a lock of hair still attached, scratched with a pair of kanji. Your creator is dead, Alondra said, holding the piece of porcelain in her palm. Do you carry a reflection of his soul? The maelstrom fell silent. A single voice spoke, a man's voice. He sounded older than she expected. She didn't have enough Japanese to understand him, but his honey wheedling spread goose flesh over her torso. She recalled how her brother spoke to her, the courtly compliments that told her how special, how beautiful, how crucial she was. Once more, she was a frightened girl, well aware of how quickly sweet words dissolved into violence. She picked up the doll's unbroken leg and hammered it down on the porcelain shard in her hand. Sharp splinters sliced her palm. Shadows swarmed through the room. Clothing was shredded, toilet toiletries smashed from the dresser, photography books torn into confetti. It took the wanton destruction for Alondra to realize there were no other dolls in this room. She continued to smash the fragment of porcelain in her palm until it was reduced to dust. Every time the hammer fell, she felt as if she stabbed the memory of her brother and what he'd done to her. Finally, she blew across the porcelain dust, dispersing shimmering powder into the air. You are released. Silence answered her. Alondra said, Sakura-chan, are you safe? We are alone now, 